to worship this morning with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. We are so grateful that you've chosen to worship with us this day. I encourage you to follow along with your worship bulletin if you've received one from the church office. And in the future, if you'd like to receive one, reach out to us here at the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church and we'll be sure you can receive one either via mail or email. As you worship together, also, I encourage you to share this worship video or the video broadcast of our Bible studies or other events with friends and neighbors near and far as we continue to connect through this wonderful gift of technology. As you worship together this morning, please join me in our call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Let us worship. I invite you to join with me, first in a united one voice of communal prayer, acknowledging the need to repent of our wrongdoings, the need to acknowledge to God times we've stepped away from God's intentions, the times when we either out of omission or commission have either forgotten or set aside or ignored something God has directed us to do, or we have purposely engaged in things that are evil, that are sinful, and that require us to repent and ask for God's forgiveness. After we pray together in one voice, I invite you into a time of silent prayer and reflection to ask God for personal forgiveness. Let us pray together. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May we, your people, be illumined by your word and sacraments as we shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, so that he may be known, worshipped, and obey to the ends of the earth. Grant us the unity which only your Spirit can give. Keep us in the bond of peace. Bring all of creation to worship before your throne. Redeem us and hear our prayers. Amen. We proclaim that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. To all who received him, he gave power to become children of God. We have seen him through the gift of the Holy Spirit in the lives of our neighbors and each other. As children of God, grace-filled, loved, and free, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This morning, as an act of worship, as we turn to scripture and lift up the words of song, we invite the Holy Spirit to challenge us and call us to hear these words proclaim the goodness of God and call us into a deeper sense of awe about the amazingness of God our Creator. Hear these words from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. The Affirmation of Faith is a selection of a brief statement of faith from 1983. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, 
sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor and brings us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. Amen. the truth of Jesus Christ as our Messiah and the presence of the Holy Spirit, I invite you into a time of prayer as we prepare ourselves to hear God's word. Let us pray. Creator God, we are so grateful for those who have gone before us. We are thankful for the saints who have called upon your name, who have followed Jesus, who have used the gift of the Holy Spirit to enable ministry to continue at all times, in all places, through any person who responds to your call. Lord, we thank you that scripture records amazing call stories, acts of discipleship, teachings and learnings, and ways that we can also participate in the ministry of Christ. As we read your word proclaimed in scripture today, guide us, Lord, afresh and anew, to recommit ourselves as disciples of our living Lord Jesus. We ask this all in the name of our Messiah. Amen. This morning we'll be reading in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, beginning with verse 35. Hear these words. The next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples. When John saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard John say this, they followed Jesus. 
Turning around, Jesus saw the two men following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, Jesus replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So this is a gospel account of the calling of some of the first disciples of Jesus. As we read through all four of the Gospels, we get different glimpses into different portions of this call narrative. How different disciples out of that original 12 that so famously are so close-knit and follow Jesus very intensely and purposefully through his three years of earthly ministry. And who then later, after the ascension of Jesus, are then the apostles or the elders, the beginning of the formal church as it begins to evangelize the name of Christ. And as we read through each of the four Gospels, we get different glimpses as to the personalities of these 12 men, as to how they were called and how they responded to that call, and to how they were integral into the ministry of Jesus. For the Gospel of John, the focus here on these early disciples reminds us or draws our attention to the fact that they were not new to being believers in the one true God. And they were not new even to being disciples. To be a disciple is not uniquely a term only for followers of Jesus. You can be a disciple of any person or anything. Most people who are an apprentice or an intern, they are being discipled, disciplined, in a certain area, a skill set, a thought process. You can be a disciple of any vocation or hobby or even a philosophy of life. So John the Baptist, who we talked about last week, who baptized Jesus and who was already baptizing, engaging in ritual washing and preparation of those who believed in the one true God, calling them to repentance, calling them to prepare, John the Baptist had his own disciples, his own entourage, if you will, his own gathering of individuals who would come into the wilderness to hear John preach and teach, who responded to his call to repent of their sins, to prepare their hearts for this one coming who was greater than John, to be baptized in that moving rushing water of the river. And several of those who had come and participated in John's ministry had hung around hadn't just come once or twice or just for their baptism and then disappeared. They stayed and became students, disciples of John, witnessing and teaching those others who gathered and also learning more from John himself. They had become these kind of in-between people who were in between John and the newcomer, the visitor, the curious, the seeker. They were students of John who then helped to share his message of preparation for one greater than him. So in the Gospel of John, the baptism of Jesus is not lifted up the way it was in our reading from last week. The birth of Jesus and the whole pilgrimage to Bethlehem and the story of the Magi, that's not lifted up. John begins with this focus on makes sense, John the Baptist, and his preparations for someone coming greater than him. The account we read today happens the day after the baptism. The day after. Now the interesting part of that is, when we read the baptism narrative last Sunday, it speaks about Jesus immediately being cast out into the wilderness for a time of trial. That is absent here. Instead, the focus is on the immediacy of the calling of disciples. 
Now, if we want to be scholars of the language and of history, we can argue about timelines and what happened before what and the chronology of Jesus's life. But it's probably more important to just focus on that for this gospel, it's not so much the time as it is that the first action of Jesus's ministry in this gospel, the first thing that this gospel author wants to point out is that people followed Jesus. That's how his ministry began. His public ministry did not start with a great sermon, a great miracle. It didn't start with an exorcism. It didn't start with an act of political disobedience. It didn't start with a big speech on a soapbox in the corner or a philosophical engagement with church leaders or synagogue leaders or religious leaders or even the government. It didn't start with a religious or a military or political coup. No. For the Gospel of John, the intent of its author is to focus on the fact that discipleship is what makes Jesus's ministry start, continue, and still be a success. The other details that are omitted are still true and relevant, but the focus for this gospel author is on discipleship as the primary role of the ministry of Jesus and its successful ongoing outcomes. So John the Baptist has his own followers, his disciples, and two of them, one here is named Andrew. We don't know the other one's name right away, but Andrew and his compatriot, his friend, his fellow disciple are with John the Baptist. And this is just after John has seen the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus and his ministry begin. And John turns to his disciples, Andrew and the other one, and says, look, there's the Lamb of God. In other words, the one I've been preparing for. And immediately, Andrew and the other disciple of John walk over to follow Jesus. And they have kind of this odd encounter with Jesus, this odd questioning back and forth that may not be what you or I would think would be the first question you would ask. Now, you've been under the tutorage, the, the teaching, the mentorship of John the Baptist the son of a high priest, one who's baptizing and preaching in the wilderness, and he's telling you to prepare for someone greater than him. Then he turns to you and says, there he is, there's the guy we've been getting ready for. Now, I would think that you or I, if that was us, we would rush over and say, is it you? Are you really the one? Are you the Lamb of God? Are you the one that scripture and prophets and, and just the spirit within us has been leading us to? Instead, they have this weird, kind of uh, odd interaction where Jesus kind of turns to them and is like, well, what are you looking for? What's, what's going on? And they say, oh, where are you staying? And then they follow him to wherever he's lodging. It's a much more subdued encounter. And it's kind of unsatisfying. We, we want it to be exciting. We want it to be this big like epiphany event, this big enlightenment of, oh, you are the son of God and I met you face to face. And instead it's kind of like, Hey, Jesus, what have you been up to? Where are you staying? Let's go uh, hang out together. And so Andrew and the other disciple follow Jesus to wherever he's lodging nearby. They spend the rest of the day with him. And they're not privy to what they talk about. But one would assume Jesus is getting to know them and they're getting to know him. And he's teaching and, and sharing. And as a result, Andrew is convinced that Jesus really is the one they've been waiting for. In fact, he's so convinced that he goes home to his biological brother, Simon, and says, Simon, come with me. I have found the Messiah. And his brother, who more than likely was also a disciple of John, his brother comes with Andrew and meets Jesus. And when they encounter each other for the first time, Jesus greets Simon and says, you are Simon, but from now on, your name is Peter. This is their first encounter. And we know Andrew and Peter go on to be part of that original 12 disciples of Jesus. And if we continue to read the gospel, we then hear the call stories of Philip and other disciples in the coming verses. But this call story, it starts with this in-between role for Andrew. Andrew, a disciple of John, is pointed by his mentor, his rabbi, his teacher, John, pointed to Jesus. 
And then Andrew accepts the invitation and goes to Jesus and then accepts Jesus's invitation to spend the day with him. And then Andrew feels a call in his own heart that yes, this is the one I've been waiting for. And immediately he wants to share that good news with his brother. And he goes and gets his brother Simon and says, Simon, come with me. I wanna introduce you to the Messiah. So Andrew fulfills the call to be a disciple. A disciple has a twofold role, not simply being a student, not simply learning a skill, a philosophy, a way of being, a way of life from someone who you respect as being an expert in that field or area. But in addition to being the student of someone you feel has more wisdom or knowledge or skill than you, once you have gained some of that knowledge and skill, you then go and evangelize. You share the good news of what you've learned. You witness, offer testimony. You go and tell other people, this is great. This is what I've learned. I want you to know more and be a part of it too. So first you're the student, but then very quickly you also become the teacher to others who are curious, who are seeking, who have yet to be exposed to the full message that your teacher has offered. Andrew is the first successful disciple in this account of this gospel. Andrew, as a student of John, and then a student of Jesus, turns around and becomes a teacher to his brother Simon, who is then almost immediately renamed Peter, and will take a very pivotal role in the rest of the unfolding of the gospel story. Andrew was prepared by John. Andrew, who was more than likely baptized by John, who then listened to John's preaching and teaching, was open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Andrew, in a, in a very non-explosive, non-excited, non-controversial way, responded to his mentor, his teacher, John, saying, there's the Lamb of God. And Andrew just turned very casually and with great ease towards Jesus and spent the day with him. And began that relationship. And after just one day with Jesus, Andrew turned and said, I need to go tell my brother and invite him to be a part of this too. That is discipleship. Christian discipleship is deciding ourselves as an individual to follow Jesus and to learn from his teachings and then to share those teachings, to share that good news with other people inviting them to walk alongside us in discipleship. Andrew is not spoken of very often. Andrew's not a name we tend to lift up. If anything, it's Peter, his brother, who gets most of the attention for the rest of the gospel narrative. But for the gospel of John, it's Andrew, who's the first successful disciple of Jesus, both a student of Jesus's teaching and an evangelist to others convincing and calling them to come and follow Jesus as well. And Andrew makes it look really simple, really casual, really easy. Oh, there's Jesus. Let me go hang out with him for the day. Oh, I like him. I understand him. I believe who he is. Let me go tell somebody else and bring them tomorrow to come and do the same thing. That's the example of discipleship I think is very attainable for you and for I, for anyone who follows Christ. If we identify as followers of Jesus, as students of Jesus' teaching, as imitators of Jesus' life and ministry, the next part of our discipleship journey is then to turn to others in our life, others who trust us and who maybe want to follow other things we do in our life, who find us to be someone that they have an affinity with, enough in common with that we probably would like the same things, to turn to those people and say, I follow Jesus. Come and find out more about him. I think you'll like him too. And I think if once you're in relationship with him and understand him better, you too will consider yourself a disciple of Jesus. And as you learn from Jesus and the community of faith gathered around him, the large circle of disciples that thankfully has expanded well beyond Andrew and Peter, as you join this family of believers that is the church, in addition to being a student of Jesus, you're encouraged to share with others the good news and invite them in as well. 
Now, during this time of separation, it can feel harder to evangelize, to testify, to witness to our faith, and to invite others to come to church. Because that's traditionally what we think of with discipleship. Well, I'm going to bring a friend to church on Sunday. I'm going to bring my spouse, bring my child, bring my neighbor, bring my colleague. I'm going to bring them to the church building for a fellowship event, a mission event, some sort of encounter, maybe a worship service, a picnic. As those things aren't happening the same way now, it may actually make it a little bit less overwhelming to reach out. Now, evangelism can be sharing a link to a video. It can be sharing a Facebook feed update. <coughs> Excuse me. It can be sharing a Bible study, inviting someone to join us on a live Zoom worship service or Bible study event. It can be a handwritten note to someone or a phone call or an email about your faith and what you've learned. It can be even our most recent videos about the history of hymns or before that Christmas carols and saying, hey, do you like trivia? Do you like music? This is about church music. You might find this interesting. So I encourage us to be more like Andrew, the first successful disciple. Andrew, who did not look to be in the spotlight, Andrew, who was eager to follow and learn and be connected to other people seeking what he was seeking in his relationship with God. Andrew, who simply went up to Jesus and said, well, let's get to know each other. And afterwards turned to his most beloved and close friend, his own brother, and said, come, I want to share this with you. So I encourage you to share. I encourage you, encourage you to share in an authentic way that is, is who you are and the way you usually communicate and interact with those who are close to you and important to you. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be the preacher you see or the evangelist you see or the missionary you see. Don't try to emulate and be them. Be you and share what your relationship is with Jesus and invite others into a relationship that is unique and appropriate for who they are. For genuine discipleship should be as free and easy and casual as Andrew made it look in the Gospel of John. Oh, there's Jesus. Thanks for pointing him out. I'll go hang out with him for the day. And tomorrow, I'll bring more people to meet him. Let's all try to be disciples that are authentic and easygoing and inviting, but also eager and on task. Andrew didn't wait years to invite his brother to come. The very next day, he invited him. He was excited to share and excited to expand that circle around Jesus right away. So may we too be called into that enthusiasm, yet the appropriate representation of who we are. Amen. As we turn from scripture now to a time of prayer, of course, we want to lift up the reality of what is in the week ahead for us. There is an inauguration coming up on Wednesday of a new president of the United States. And depending on how we all feel, which can really change from day to day with the events of our nation, community, and even our own households, it will stir up a lot of emotions this week. Some of us will be overjoyed. Some of us will be distraught. Some of us will ride that roller coaster of emotion all week. Some people will choose not to turn the television on or listen to the news this week just to, to calm and quiet it. Others will be glued to their television sets in the 24-7 news cycle. Wherever you may be in that, we need to be reminded that God is in control and Christ is King. And the Holy Spirit is what empowers us to share the good news, no matter who is in power and no matter who is creating any controversy. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that through your Holy Spirit, we can find calm and reassurance and comfort in a world around us that sometimes seems just overwhelming with negativity, hatred, and division. Lord, we came into the year of 2021 looking for relief and hope, and we know we can still find it in you. Let us be more like the great disciple, Andrew. Let us be eager and be authentic in our desire to learn from you and be in relationship with you as our Messiah. 
and like Andrew, may we reach out to those whom we love and share with them the good news, inviting them to also follow Christ, to learn from him, and to be more like him as we love God and love one another. We ask all of this as your disciples whom you taught how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go from this time of worship out into the world in the week ahead, I encourage you to be an authentic disciple. You don't need to be Andrew. You need to be yourself, a child of God, beloved, unique, and known by name, and use who you are to authentically share the good news of Jesus, inviting others to follow him as well. Go now with the blessings of God, our creator, Jesus, our Messiah, and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit.